so this webinar is being recorded. We will set it'll automatically be sent to you afterwards. Uh, the handouts are not live in this um, in this webinar, but we will send links to all of them afterwards, so you'll be able to access all of them. Uh, we'll be answering questions at the end of the webinar. You can type them into the questions box anytime during the webinar, and we will monitor it throughout. We have about four Cub staffers on right now to monitor questions so that we can answer them in an organized way at the end of the webinar. Uh, you're all currently muted, but we will unmute you at the end. And then, like I said, the handouts are going to be uh, emailed afterwards. So I apologize for the technical difficulties at the beginning. Um, I'll quickly go over this in case you couldn't hear all the details, um, but we were founded in 1983. We represent Illinois utility rate payers and we advocate for cleaner and cheaper energy. Through that, we've saved consumers over $20 billion, mostly by fighting proposed electricity, natural gas, and telephone rate hikes. And we have a hotline that you can call if you have any concerns or questions about your utility bills. The number is right there, but it's also on all of our materials as well. Um, and so you can give us a call. We're open from nine to four, Monday through Friday, and we can help you out with any utility issues uh, that you might have or point you in the right direction. Okay. So we'll start with the, the first question of, um, you know, we're gonna go through the cable part first and then we'll move to going through the robocall part. So we'll start with the question of why isn't TV free anymore? Um, so the reason, so TV used to be used to be free because the content was supported by the commercials. So the 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 um, channels would broadcast out their channels for free, and they would support all of the cost of creating that content and broadcasting it just through the commercials. But then, as with many things, cable companies realized that they could create premium content and charge money for it and make more money that way than just through ad revenue alone. So with that got us to a point where channels are sold in packages. And so even if you only wanna watch one premium channel, like one sports channel or one um, channel that has you know, good, good TV shows, you still have to buy an entire package, which makes it expensive for customers because you can't just pick and choose what you wanna watch. I'm sure anyone who has cable has a lot of channels on there included in their package that they never really watch. Um, the lack of competition also makes it really expensive for customers because there's only really a couple cable companies that you can go with and they're all going to offer you pretty similar packages and pretty similar prices and they all have a really bad habit of giving you a good introductory rate and then increasing the rate as you go on. So rather than being rewarded for being a loyal customer, you actually end up getting charged more as time goes on. And that lack of competition makes it really expensive for customers. So we're going to go through some tips for how to how to deal with that. Um, and we'll also be talking about how the internet gives us a lot more options that can save that can save a lot of money. So we will go through the options um, in order of kind of most most traditional to most modern. And so the, the first ones that we'll go over is, you know, the over the air TV, that's like ABC, CBS. Then we'll talk about traditional cable. We'll also talk about alternatives to traditional cable, such as satellite TV and internet cable. And then we'll move on to talking about online streaming. So I'm just gonna very quickly go through all of these options right now. And then uh, we'll talk more about cutting the cable, cutting the cable cord later and, you know, the logistics of what it would look like if you wanted to sign up for streaming. So the first type of TV is the over-the-air TV. Uh, this is when you get major networks delivered to your home through an antenna. This is like ABC, CBS, NBC. The pro is that it's free, uh, but the cons are that choices are limited. It's only a handful of channels and that reception can be poor or unreliable. So because of that, a lot of people moved to you know, something more expensive, but that works better, like traditional cable. This is when you have TV delivered to your home over a fiber optic cable. Uh, this is like Comcast, AT&T, or RCN. The pros is that it's much wider channel choices, but the cons is that it's expensive and it's not available everywhere. Satellite TV is another option. Uh, if, if cable doesn't deliver to your area or if you just choose to go with satellite instead, 
So similar, similarly, it's the pros or it's wide channel choices. It's available in more rural areas than, than cable, but the cons are that it's expensive and reception can be poor and it requires installation of a satellite dish. So you want to be you want to be, um, you know, pretty sure that you want to stick with that company for a while before you install the satellite dish. Give me one second. Okay. Another option is telco TV. This is when you have TV offered by a traditional landline phone company and delivered to your home over fiber optic or copper phone lines. This is can be offered through AT&T UVerse or through Verizon. Same thing, wide channel choices, but it's expensive and not available everywhere. Um, then the, the most modern option is online streaming. This is companies like Netflix, Hulu, Amazon Prime, uh, Sling, and YouTube. There's a lot of options. The, the pros is that it's significantly lower prices compared to you know, a cable package that could be $90, $120. You can subscribe to just one of these for you know, $10, $12 a month. So it's significantly cheaper. And it can be a good supplement to basic TV. The, the negatives are that it requires a subscription to each service. So any one service is not going to have every TV show that you might watch on cable. And so, you know, if, you, if there's two different shows that you like, they might end up being on two different streaming platforms. And then you have to subscribe to both if you wanna be able to see both of them. So it's very segmented. Uh, it also requires high-speed internet. And we'll be talking more in a couple pages or in a couple slides about what you, what you would do if you actually wanted to sign up for, um, for streaming. Okay, so we'll go through tips for cutting your cable bill. So these, the, these first tips are going to be tips for if you wanna keep your cable bill, but you just wanna try to make sure it's as low as possible. And then we'll go on to tips for if you want to just get rid of your cable package entirely and have um, and have streaming and other options. So I've divided these tips into tips before you call the cable company and then tips for while you're on the phone with the cable company. All of these tips are included in the cable guide that I will send out as well. So uh, in addition to having this recording, you'll have access to the PDF of the cable guide. It's about 20 pages long. It's very comprehensive and it goes over all these same tips in detail. So you'll be able to read more about any of them or the rationale behind any of them if, if you have questions. It's a really good resource. So the first tip is to look at your current bill line by line because you wanna make sure that you understand, um, you wanna make sure that you understand all of the charges that are there. Um, and so you wanna look through and if there's any charges that you don't understand what they mean, make a little note or maybe highlight or underline it. And then when you call the cable company, go ask them to go through each and every one of those charges that you don't understand so that you can learn whether or not it's an optional charge that you could opt out of potentially, or whether or not it's a, it's a fixed charge. A lot of them will be fixed charges that you won't be able to, to get out of. Um, but um, a lot of them will be fixed charges, but it's still really good to make sure that you understand what all the charges are because that's a way that companies can, you know, slip slip additional things in. You also want to find hidden deals. So that refers to uh, the fact that if you have an, a home package where you have your cable, your internet, and your phone all through one package, if you go onto the computer and you go to, you say, say you have Comcast, you go to the Comcast website and you want to look to see what their most basic or their cheapest or their introductory rate packages, they know that you're already a customer. They might only show you on their homepage the, the package that you have as the most basic, basic package and then only show you packages that are better from there. Um, and so, or better meaning more expensive includes more things. So if you wanna make sure that you know what the most basic package is, you might have to go use like a computer at a library or go into incognito mode or you know, look on your phone when it's not connected to your Wi-Fi so that you can see what they're offering potentially new customers and you can use those details of that offer to leverage on the call. Um, you also wanna find out what the competition charge is. So like I said before, unfortunately, there isn't a ton of competition. It's There's just kind of a couple of companies that charge similar amounts, but you still wanna be able to, you know, if you're calling Comcast, say AT&T offers this, and kind of pit these companies against each other. Same thing, 
you're calling AT&T, say Comcast offers this. No one is better than the other or recommended by Cub, but you just want to kind of use that to your advantage as much as possible. Um, and then while you're on the phone with the cable company, you want to request the cancellation or the retention department. That's the department of the call center that's going to be able to add the most discounts to your to your bill because that's the department that's authorized to do what it takes to try to keep you on as a customer and so they're authorized to add more um, um, they're authorized to add more you know discounts to your bill in order to ideally keep you on as a customer so you want to ask for that for that department the next tip is to be nice uh, you know you you want to be you want to show that you're an informed customer that you're that you want to, and you want to, you know, convey that you want to lower your bill, but you also aren't more likely to get somewhere if you're, um, if you're nice and not, you know, antagonizing whoever has answered the phone. Don't be afraid to ask for a better deal. So, uh, you know, don't be afraid to say like, I saw this package on the, on the, on the internet and I want to, I want to lower it to that. So don't be afraid to directly ask if what, if they can add a discount, you know, you can say it, like I've been a customer for a long time, can you add any sort of discounts? And oftentimes when they add discounts, they'll add them for only a year. So you unfortunately need to, this is kind of an ongoing process, you need to call them back once a year. And sometimes some of the companies will put little notes underneath the underneath each discount and say when it expires, which is helpful because then you know which month to call them back. Um, but if if they don't have that note, then you have to keep track of, you know, how many more months until it expires, because those almost always expire after a year. The next tip is to don't get, try not to get upsold. So a lot of times what will happen is if you call and you say that you, um, you know, that you're unhappy with how high your cable bill is, they'll say, oh, we're so sorry to hear that. We can give you stars for free, or we can give you HBO for free. And they hope that that will make you feel Good enough about the call uh, but the thing is is that oftentimes they will add that extra thing for free and it'll only be free for a year for six months three months whatever it may be and then they'll start charging you for it so not only has your bill not gone down it's actually gone up uh, so make sure not to you know if your if your goal is to lower your bill make sure to not say yes to that kind of offer be open to locking it in so this is referring to the fact that you can sometimes get a better deal by signing a contract, either a one-year or two-year contract with the company rather than doing a month-to-month -month deal. And like I've said, a lot of these offers from companies are really similar. So if you can get a good deal with one company by locking it in for a year, that's better than, even though that, that closes the door to you switching to another company until that contract is over, it can be better than, um, it can be, get you a better deal than, you know, just trying to, constantly leave the door open to switching. Then you also want to definitely take notes. So you want to be able to, if you have to call back a second time, you want to be able to reference exactly what you were offered or what you were told by the first person that you talked to. So you can also make sure to write down, the, you can ask them for their name and their employee ID number as well, because oftentimes they'll give you their first name. That's not going to help you very much when you're trying to reference what the, um, that's not going to help very much when you try to reference, you know, what exactly what was offered to you. So try to get their ID number as well. And then the next tip, the final tip is to buy your own modem. So the modem, a modem and router, those are two pieces of equipment that are needed um, if you want to have a Wi-Fi signal in your house, which is wireless internet. Comcast allows you to buy your own modem, but AT&T does not. The, um, it, when I send around the handouts, a couple hours after this webinar is over. I'll include a link to Cubs fact sheet about buying your own router and modem. You can buy them at a store like um, like Best Buy or um, Target, stores like that will have them. And that can allow you to, if you're a Comcast customer, that can allow you to avoid you know, a $10 a month charge. So you have to buy them up front and they can be about $100. But then you know, if, if they last for three years, that's an upfront investment that's saving you money over time. Unfortunately, AT&T does not allow you to buy your own modem. So we will now move on to tips to if you wanted to cut the cord and give up your cable service entirely. I have two polls um, 
that I'm going to run really quickly to see how many people are interested in in giving up cable service entirely, just so that I can get a sense of what the audience is interested in hearing about. So you should be able to see this poll on the screen now, and we'll give that a couple seconds to Okay, I'll go ahead and close that. It looks like about 75% of you voted. 50% said yes, you would be interested in giving up cable service entirely. 17% said no, and 33% said I'm not sure. So sounds like a lot of you would be interested in, um, in the next tips on the next page. So let me go to the next poll. We have a set one, one more poll. Uh, this asks what you typically watch on cable. The reason that this is a and you, this is one where you can select as many options as you would like. The, the reason that we ask this question is because, um, is because certain things are easier to access on streaming. So certain things are easier to replace with streaming than others. And so it's just helpful to get a sense. Give this another couple seconds. Okay, go ahead and close the poll. So um, the answer that got the highest amount of votes was news. 84% of you said you watched the news. Uh, next highest was the sitcoms, dramas, other scripted shows category, followed by movies, and then live sports and reality TV. So some of those things are easier to replace than others. Uh, live sports is one of the ones that can be hardest to replace with um, with streaming because a lot of streaming content is just not designed to be live but we'll go over the options and how they work right now so streaming is when you um when you get programming tv programming over the internet and um have that go directly to presenting on your TV and you do that for a monthly subscription so we're going to go over what you need in order to stream TVs and movies in your home. Okay, so the first thing that you need is either a smart TV, which there's an example on the screen of what a smart TV could look like. Uh, they're all gonna, all the brands are gonna look a little bit different, um, but they're all gonna be similar and that they'll have this landing page that'll have these little tiles that will automatically connect you to the different streaming apps so that all the home pages will look a little different but they're going to be able to connect you to the same types of things so you can either use a smart tv or you can use an older tv that's equipped with a streaming device and then you also need to have a wireless interconnection internet connection in your home so you need to have the type of the type of internet where uh you know if someone comes over to visit and they want to log into the internet on your on their phone or on their tablet, they'd be able to do that. So not the type of internet where you need to have it plugged into your computer at all times. And that's what the Wi-Fi symbol looks like. Some popular streaming devices, and there's a full list on page 10 and 11 of the cable guide, uh, is the first one is a Roku, um, which is, this, one's po uh, this one works well because it doesn't, you can use it to connect to a wide variety of streaming platforms and so what it looks like is this little black box and then it comes with a little remote and uh, when you log into the Roku you'll be able to log into then Netflix or Hulu or YouTube or HBO Go or whatever things you've subscribed to. Another option is the Apple TV. It looks similar to the Roku uh, but it's branded with the Apple logo and with that you need to purchase an Apple TV subscription. So the nice thing about Roku is that there's, 
you don't have to purchase any sort of subscription. You just buy the device and then you can choose which subscriptions to purchase after you purchase the device. Uh, other ones like Apple TV and the Amazon Fire Stick, they come with they come with specific subscriptions already. So this is what the Amazon Fire Stick looks like. It still has their remote, and then instead of a box, it looks kind of like a thicker flash drive. So like I said, pages 10 and 11 of the cable guide have um, a more have a lot more detail about the typical cost of these devices and um, and you know what the different features of them are. Roku is a brand of streaming device that has a lot of different options. So there's simpler ones that are less expensive and then there's more complicated ones that are more expensive, um, but there's different options. You can choose what you want. The pros of streaming are that it's lower subscription costs. Like I said, you know, each one might only be 10 or 12, $15 per month instead of $100 for your cable package. There's thousands of choices, including, you know, old TV shows, new TV shows, um, lots of movies. There's also customized programming. So all, almost all of these platforms, Netflix, Hulu, Amazon, they all make their own TV shows. And so you have to be a Netflix customer in order to watch their original, their original content. It's easy to sign up online for all of these. So what you would do is you would just create an account online and then you can log in either through your smart TV or through your streaming device. That's going to be easier than creating an account on your TV because you'll have to type in your email and your password and everything just on that little remote, kind of going through the little, the little alphabet. So it's easier to do it on your computer. Uh, the cons are that it requires high-speed internet. So if you don't already have high-speed internet in your home and you don't already have Wi-Fi in your home, that's just going to increase the upfront investment that will be required before you can get on board with streaming. And then the con is that it, another con is that it requires either a smart TV or a streaming device. There's a lack or, or limited live content. A lot of uh, the big news channels will offer their they will offer a, an app version of their programming, and so there you can kind of look into the different channels that you know that you if you want to cancel your cable, you can look into the different channels that you know that you want to watch frequently and see if they offer a streaming option and um, if most of the ones that you want to that you want to watch offer a streaming option then you're going to be able to pretty easily replace your cable with streaming and another con and something to be aware of is just that it can add up so you know if you're trying to replace your trying to reduce your hundred dollar cable bill but then you end up subscribing to six of these streaming platforms then it can add up over time so even though they're all um, each one is pretty cheap, you'd want to be aware of how many you're signing up for because it can add up. Okay, these are some popular streaming services. Again, the cable guide goes into more detail about the about the streaming options. Prime Video is Amazon's streaming service. DirecTV Now and HBO Now, these are um, these are ones that, or HBO Now is one that's so it's a it's the streaming version of the channel, like I was mentioning. So this is having HBO now is different than just having the HBO channel. This means that you have a tile available in your smart TV where you can click on it and it'll take you to basically like on demand HBO. So you can watch any of the HBO content that's available at any time that you want. It's different than just having the channel where it's playing whatever it's playing live. Hulu and Netflix are probably the two biggest streaming services. Um, and then there's some additional ones as well. Sling TV is offering a happy hour during the stay at home order. So from 5 p.m. to midnight every night, they're offering um, all of their service, all of their content or a lot of their content for free. So you don't have to be subscribed to them. So if you have a smart TV, you can just go to, into the Sling app and they have, they'll have free content every evening that you can choose what to watch. So that's a good that's a good one to know about right now. The other option for cutting your um, the other option for cutting your cable bill entirely is um, to do an HDTV antenna. So this is an antenna that will receive the signal for 
those over the air those over the air channels and so a digital antenna and streaming together can be a really good replacement because digital antenna will get you those local channels like PBS and the local news channels and you'll be able to watch those live and then you can watch the whatever TV shows movies that you like from the streaming platforms you can watch those as well so those two together can be a really good replacement um, it gets HDTV antenna gets local channels, but there can be some lagging experienced. Our cable guide goes into more detail about how to get the right antenna. You want to find out what channels are available. Uh, so there's some links here that are also in the cable guide. You also want to make sure that you get the right type of antenna. The right type of antenna is mostly determined based on where you live relative to the nearest TV tower. So omnidirectional versus directional antenna refers to whether or not the antenna um, can receive signals from all directions at once, or if you're pointing it and it's receiving directions or receiving signals from one direction. So if you live uh, greater than 25 miles from the nearest TV tower, it's recommended that you get a directional antenna so that you can point it in the direction of like the nearest city or the nearest larger town. And it'll pick up the signal from that direction. If you live less than 25 miles from the nearest town, you can, you can um, go for an omnidirectional antenna, which will pick up signals from all around. Because if you live in a more densely populated area, there's likely multiple TV towers around, and so it's better to be able to pick up all of them. Amplified versus non-amplified. Uh, amplified is just going to make it so that you can receive a signal from farther away. And again, that's recommended if you live more than 25 miles away from the nearest TV tower. Uh, Non-amplified is, is a little bit simpler and better for if you, if you don't live as far away. And then indoor versus outdoor. Indoor is going to be a lot easier to install. You just kind of set it up by a window. Uh, outdoor is one you might have to like mount on the roof. So it again depends on how strong of a signal you need. Um, so outdoor antenna is going to be better if you need if you're farther away from the TV tower and you need to receive a better a better signal. And then you always want to look at the price and make sure that you understand what the different options are and then understand what the warranty is or the return policy. So if you buy one and you want to be, return it a couple months later, are they going to allow you to do that? So check that either with the device manufacturer or with the um, the store or the online store where you buy it. And again, the cable guide goes into more detail. We also have in the cable guide a helpful cutting the cord checklist. It's on page 17 of the packet. Uh, and all, all these page numbers that I've been referring to are listed in the um, are listed in the email that I'll send out afterwards. So I'll have the link to the cable guide and then, you know, page 10, that's the streaming devices, page 17, that's this checklist. And so it's a helpful little worksheet where you can compare what you're paying now for cable to what you would have to pay if you um, were to switch to streaming or to switch to an HDTV antenna. So it includes both the startup costs, the, the cost for buying those devices, and then the, the recurring monthly costs for whatever you're subscribing to. So we'll move into the robocall section of the of the presentation now. There is also a robocall guide that will be included in the handouts. Um, and um, yeah, that'll be included in the handouts that we send out. But we'll go through the robocall right now, and then we will um, move to any questions that anyone has at the end. So what is a robocall? Robocall is a pre-recorded message from computer generated dialers. So it's not someone sitting there actually dialing your number. It's some sort of um, computer that is that is automatically dialing a bunch of numbers at once, which is what makes them pretty pesky. Illinois, unfortunately, gets a fair amount of robocalls compared to other states. Uh, we rank number eight in the nation in terms of highest number of robocalls. And in March 2019 alone, we received 183 million robocalls, over 183 million robocalls. Some robocalls are legal, and so it's important to understand the distinction between the two. Um, they are legal if they are not sales calls, and there are, certain entities are allowed to send out pre-recorded messages, such as information calls that might come from, you know, your child's school or from um, like a 
like a legislator in your district to let you know about an event coming up, those those are allowed. Debt collectors are also allowed to use robocalls. Um, politicians, healthcare providers, banks, phone carriers, and charities can all use robocalls legally. But unfortunately, a lot of the robocalls that people get are scams. So this is a pie chart showing you the breakdown. Uh, about 17% of the robocalls are telemarketing. About 21% are alerts and reminders. So this is this and the payment reminders are probably the most legitimate types of robocalls. You know, they're actually trying to communicate something relevant to you. And then unfortunately, the largest portion of this pie chart is scams. So up to almost 45% of robocalls are scams. And so those are the ones that we most wanna watch out for. Spoofing is one of the really common techniques that those scam robocallers will use. And so this is when they, um, when whoever is calling you makes it appear that the phone number they're calling you from is a local number. So it'll either have the same area code as your phone, or sometimes it'll even have the same area code and prefix, or even, even more, and it'll be really similar to your number. And the reason that they do that is because they assume that you're more likely to pick up if it's the same area code because, you know, it could be the doctor, it could be a neighbor that you haven't saved in your phone calling you. And so that's why people are more likely to pick up. I think at this point they've used this technique so much that now people are skeptical even if the phone number is pretty similar to theirs or even if the phone number has their area code. But um, it's still a technique that they use a lot and that's called spoofing. So it's when they route the number through um, through another number or just make it appear as if it's a number that's close by. Some common scams include the IRS, um, you know, sorry, the a common scam is, you know, someone pretending to be from the IRS or pretending to be from the Social Security Administration. It's important to know that the IRS and the Social Security Administration will never call you on the phone. So they will always contact you via um, in writing. So if you get a phone call that's claiming to be the IRS or the Social Security Administration, you should just hang up. Some, some robocalls will pretend to be your health insurance company. Some of them will just say, can you hear me? And we'll talk in a moment about why those, those robocalls are dangerous. Uh, some of them will be in another language. And then some of them will be uh, from electric and gas companies, you know, pretending to be your, pretending to be your utility company. Those are ones we're from, very familiar with at Cub. So some tips for robocalls is our first tip is just don't answer any unknown numbers. People who need to reach you will leave a message and you can give them a call back. If you do happen to answer a robocall, hang up immediately as soon as you realize. Don't, don't say anything, just hang up. Uh, do not call back or follow any instructions. You know, sometimes they'll leave a message and they'll say, call me back, blah, blah, blah. Don't, don't call them back or follow any of their instructions. Do not answer any questions once you've realized that it's a robocall, but especially don't answer yes or no questions, such as, can you hear me? Because sometimes what they'll do is if you say yes to that question, they'll record you saying yes, and then splice that in with other audio to make it seem like you've agreed to, um, make it seem like you've agreed to, you know, purchase something or sign up for a subscription when really you were just answering, yes, I can hear you. So if they don't identify who they are right away, if you don't determine that they're a legitimate person trying to call you, just hang up, don't answer or engage in any other questions. Can robocalls be stopped? Unfortunately, robocalls cannot be fully stopped. Uh, we have some tips, but it's really a, a problem that needs to be addressed at the federal level because, uh, these calls are coming from all over the place and calling in to states all over, all you know, crossing state lines. So it needs to be addressed at the federal level in order to really stem the tide. So there's unfortunately nothing that we can tell you that's going to stop you from ever getting a robocall again, but we can go through some, some tips. So we'll start with tips for your landline. Um, first tip again is, you know, just to let it go to voicemail. There are some call blocking devices. So this is like a device you buy that you plug into your phone um, where you can create a blacklist and a whitelist. So you'll, you'll whitelist any numbers that you want to ring through. So like your neighbors, your family, your friends, and then any number that calls you that you don't want to call you again, you can add that to the blacklist. The issue though is that because these numbers are spoofing other numbers and they're calling from different numbers all the time, you know, you might get the same, I get the same recording about like having one a five day vacation all the time, but it's coming from different numbers. 
So these devices can maybe help a little bit, but it's they're not going to totally fix it. So be, make sure you know that before you invest 70 or $80 in them. Uh, AT&T also has a Star 60 service. This is a lot, it costs $11 a month and it blocks only to up to 10 numbers from your local area. So that's not going to help with blocking robocalls, but it might help with, you know, if there's some other number that you want to block that keeps calling you. Uh, digital phones. So this is if you have a phone that's through like an internet and cable package, uh, they have different, they have different options available. So there's star codes. You can call your provider or go online to see which star codes work for your service. But star codes, uh, they allow you to do different things like send calls directly to voicemail or access your voicemail box, things like that. But they differ a little bit between the different companies. So um, I would recommend calling your company or going online to see what star codes they offer. Um, some of them have, some of these digital phones have free call blocking services that can be activated from your online account. So for AT&T Uverse, uh, you want to go to their website and search for call blocking for digital phone. And they offer something called Call Protect, and you can follow the directions there. Comcast Xfinity, um, they, you can search on their website for call screening. And like I said, these, the, all this info will be included in the robocall guide as well. But basically it differs based on which service you have. So I would just recommend calling them and asking them what they recommend or going to their website to see what they recommend. In terms of managing robocalls on your smartphone, again, you just wanna let that call go to voicemail. Uh, you can check to see if your device manufacturer offers a spam blocking service. So there's um, some that are not dependent on the carrier, but instead dependent on whatever the device manufacturer is. So like iPhone or Android. You can also use the do not disturb feature. That on iPhones looks like a little crescent moon that you can turn on. You can turn it on by, um, you can turn it on by swiping up to get to this menu. I don't know if you can see this or not, but if you swipe your phone up, you get to a little menu and then there's a little moon option. So when you turn that on, it'll make a little moon appear at the top of your phone as well. And that means that whenever that's on, no phone calls are gonna ring on your phone. They're all just gonna get sent to voicemail. So this probably isn't something that you wanna have on all the time because it means you're also gonna miss all of your calls from you know, friends and family. But if you're in a meeting or at a movie, uh, once shelter in place is over and you don't want your phone to ring during that specific set of time, you can turn it on then. You can also see what call blocking services your wireless company offers. And then there are also some third party apps. And again, the, um, those are apps that you download from the app store that can block certain calls. And I will go, the, the robocall guide goes over those as well. In terms of what's offered by the different carriers, AT&T offers call protect, Sprint offers premium caller ID, T-Mobile offers scam ID, and Verizon offers call filter. So just call them to see what they recommend. Some of these will already be automatically um, turned on on your phone, but it's just good to make sure that they're that they're already on. These are some third-party apps, um, and the, the guide goes over those in more detail. You can also choose to, on your iPhone, block all unknown callers. And so this is... Uh, this means that anyone who calls you that's not already in your contacts is just going to go straight to voicemail. So to get to that, you click on this, uh, this settings icon. It looks like a little set of gears. Then you want to scroll down to phone. And when you click on phone, then you scroll down to silence unknown callers. Make sure that this is toggled to on, which uh, it'll be on when you can see that it's highlighted green behind it instead of gray. So that means that anyone who is not in your contacts or that you have not called will go straight to your voicemail. This can be good. Uh, I sometimes have this on because it'll it'll send robocalls to voicemail. The the bad thing about this is that it'll also send, you know, if you have a package that's being delivered, it'll send that to voicemail because that's almost certainly a number that you haven't called before. Or even if you like call the doctor, they might call you back from a different number than what you called them. So that would also be sent to voicemail. So it's up to you whether or not you want to have that on, but it can be something that's helpful to have on if you would like. You can also join the do not call list. Um, you want to call that number from the phone that you want to register or register online at do not call.gov. The issue with these 
is that, um, you know, like that, like I showed on that chart, uh, almost half of the robocalls that you get are scams. So these are already people who are breaking the law by doing a, a phone scam. And so they're not going to abide by the do not call list. This is more for traditional telemarketers. So it's not really going to do very much, but it can't hurt. And then if you have any questions about any of this, you can always give Cub a call. This is our number. It's going to be on all of the materials that I send out, which will go out a couple hours after this is over. And you can also contact me. Uh, that's my direct line. And that's my email address. Um, and the, during shelter in place while I'm working from home, that, that phone number will, will ring through to my cell phone. So I will be able to answer it even though I'm not in the office. Uh, we'll go ahead and move to taking questions. You'll be able to hear some of my colleagues and they will be reading off the questions. Um, so I will give it over to them now. Thank you, Christina. Right now, uh, we've just been answering questions that have been coming in. However, someone did ask previously, what is Cub or others doing to treat internet as a utility versus only available to content providers? Uh, hard to cut back on package when the price for internet to stream is outlandish. Yeah, so that's a that's a very good question. Um, unfortunately, that's not something we are directly working on because when Cub was created, we were created by the, the by the Illinois legislature through the Cub Act, which um, gives us you know they wanted to create a third party nonpartisan group that could be a watchdog for the utility companies. And that specifically gives us, you know, a seat at the table at those um, at those rate cases. And that's how we are able to save people money. But it specifically does that for the state regulated utilities only. So that's only for electricity and gas. Um, it doesn't include cable and internet because those are regulated at the federal level. So we unfortunately don't have the same kind of pull there that we have with with the other utility companies. Um, there's some things that we were planning to do during this legislative session, but it's obviously on hold now um, with, you know, if you've paid off your, one of the things that we have proposed is if you've paid off your modem, um, so, you know, say your modem market value is worth $100. If you've made, if you've paid that $10 monthly charge for 10 months, you shouldn't be charged that anymore. It's a small change, but that's one thing that we were working on. Um, but yeah, I think it's unfortunate that um, these companies have gotten to be, you know, so powerful and we've, we would like to see that addressed at the federal level. Next question. Are there other questions on Aries? There is some, someone did mention, um, I'm, I'm not too sure about this, but Social Security can call on an application submitted recently. They've called us twice with questions for clarification. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so with that, I would just make sure that they, uh, thank you for that clarification. I would just make sure that they are, um, you know, that they, they, they have like either something that they can reference from an application that you submitted. If someone doesn't know your name and they're claiming to be the Social Security Administration or you can tell it's a recording, that's when you should be more suspicious. But if you submitted a recent application and it says on there that they might call you, then that's, then that's a different situation. Any other questions or were they all answered? We have another question um, here, Christina. Um, Will silence unknown caller include overseas callers? Yes, it'll silence just any any call that any number that you have not saved in your contacts or called recently. So you know if you call the doctor's office and then they call you back an hour later, that will ring through. But anything else will will be silenced. And that's a feature on uh, iPhone. It might be available on other phones, but it'll depend on the specific settings. And a related question, uh, can you block unwanted repetitive texts? Uh, if you are getting the text from the same number, so if they're showing up in all as all one chat 
and they're coming from the same number, then you can just block that number individually. And so the that you that you do that by going into that contact for that number and blocking the number, and then they won't be able to text you again. Um, but if you're getting these texts from different numbers all the time, blocking one number is not going to fix the fact that other numbers are are texting you. Sometimes with those automated texts um, or you know texts from political campaigns, you can opt out by just writing stop. So you can just like e even if it doesn't say text stop to opt out, you can just text stop and see if that results in them sending you a confirmation that you've been opted out. But that's if it's someone that's that's if it's like you know a list that you've been put on. Any other questions? Um, here's one. Uh, when recalling or when calling for service reduction, Comcast will never put anything in writing um, and wants an immediate decision. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's definitely um, that's definitely a large issue. Uh, that's why we recommend taking notes. And sometimes what you can do is, you know, take notes, make sure to write down their identity, the employee's ID number that you talk to, and then you can you can tell them, you know, I'm not sure, and then call back another time and see if you can get a better deal, and then reference those notes from the previous thing. It's not as good as having it as an offer in writing, uh, but it does help you have some some more leverage compared to if you don't take notes and it shows that you're you know an engaged customer that you that you're serious about getting a better deal uh but yeah it's, it doesn't fully address the issue Um, back to the uh, legislative question. Um, is there a move to get legislation to make make it so those who do robocalling will be fined and the money to go to the recipient? Any federal legislation to stop all this craziness? Um, I've heard of some federal legislation. We have we've had a um, a petition available to sign for federal legislation um, that would fine people who are entities that are engaged in robocalling. Um, I don't know of any that would, I don't know of any that would, um, um, that would find the person, find the entity and then give that money to the recipient because of the robocall because there's just so many robocalls happening all the time that there's, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of people that might've received that same call. So I don't know of any legislation that would operate that way. But like I said, in order to fully fix it, it would need to be legislation at the federal level. Uh, here's a question. How can I get Comcast to lower that cost? I've asked for speed reductions. However, the lower speeds cost as much as my current rate. My neighbor has Comcast and pays half what I do for a slightly slower speed. Yeah, so um, I, I would recommend directly referencing what your neighbor told you. That can help, um, you know, say, you know, say like, I know that my neighbor is a customer. And I know they pay this amount for a similar package, that can just show that you've done your research and maybe help a little bit. But unfortunately, like I said before, a lot of times these companies, they don't reward you for being a loyal customer. They instead just kind of lock you into these rates that go up and up. Um, so a better option might be to, to, uh, to switch to another company and get on their introductory rate for a little while. Um, or, but make sure when you call, like, threaten to cancel even if you're not planning on it, because that will move you over to the cancellation or retention department. Or if you're already there, it'll uh, potentially result in them adding some more discounts to your bill. So, 
Um, that's, that's what I would recommend there. I apologize that it's not a better recommendation. A lot of this is, you know, it kind of comes down to your own negotiations, which is unfortunate, but that's just the kind of the way it goes. Other questions? We have, uh, I can take more questions in a moment, but I wanted to take a minute to tell you about some upcoming webinars that CUB has. So we have a webinar next Thursday, same time, same place. Um, so Thursday, April 23rd at 10 a.m., we have a webinar about Illinois' new solar programs. Uh, so thanks to the Future Energy Jobs Act, which uh, passed in 2016, uh, there are a lot of new solar programs that are available in Illinois. So we'll be going over all of those, including community solar. I don't know if you've gotten any uh, solicitations from community solar or seen it online, but there's starting to be some offers there. So we'll be going over all of that. I will be giving that presentation. Um, then done Thursday, April 30th. So two weeks from now, also at 10 a.m., we'll be doing a home energy savings presentation that'll be for both Ameren and ComEd customers. Usually when we give present presentations, it's tailored to either Ameren or ComEd because we're giving them in person. And so we know what most people's utility company is, but this one, since it's online, we're going to make it, um, we're going to make it for both Ameren and ComEd customers. That one will be presented by Sarah Moskowitz. She's the deputy director of CUB. She's worked for CUB for about 19 years. So that one will be really good as well. Um, you can learn about different programs available to help you reduce your energy bills and also reduce your carbon footprint. I'll send around in the follow-up email, I'll send around, um, I'll send around the links to register to either of those, or you can also register in the same email that you signed up for this webinar, but I'll, I'll send those links in the follow-up as well. Any other questions that have come in? Hi, there is one question here, um, and it says if you cut your uh, base, if you cut your TV to only basic TV, can you still get Netflix, Hulu, YouTube service? Yes. So it. Um, yeah, streaming is completely separate from from any of the cable packages or anything else that you have. So it doesn't matter what your cable package is, or if you have no cable at all, you'll be able to still maintain your streaming with um, with Netflix or Hulu or any of those, as long as it's not something that's like included in your cable package. Like how I said, sometimes they'll you know, add stars to try to get you to stay. Maybe they'll add Netflix to get you to stay. But as long as you've signed up independent of your cable company, it'll, which is the case for most people, it won't be affected at all if you um, cut your cable subscription, uh, but you will still need to have high speed internet. Any other questions? There are none so far. Okay, well, um, like I said, we'll send around all those resources in a couple of hours. It'll come, uh, it'll look like a similar email uh, that you got, uh, like the reminder. So it'll come from, it'll come, it'll be, you know, formatted like the, the go-to webinar, but it'll have all of those resources and um, then you can email us if you have any other questions. We will stay on for another couple minutes to see if any questions pop up, but uh, thank you so much for joining and we hope that you will join for a future webinar. And I apologize again for some of the technical difficulties at the beginning. Thank you all for your patience.